In terms of how the study started, I was interested in seeing if I could determine a biological basis of mystical states. Um, that was probably how things started in the first place. Um, and I was quite uh, impressed with uh, some of the commonalities that seemed to occur between spontaneously occurring mystical states, um, such as those that occurred with meditation and with spiritual practices, and even those described you know, from near-death experiences. Uh, quite a few of those descriptions seem quite comparable uh, to descriptions of people on large doses of psychedelic drugs. And so I started to think about the, uh, of the possibility of some kind of compound in the brain with psychedelic properties that could be underlying some of these spontaneous experiences. I began becoming interested in the pineal gland as a, a possible source of some kind of psychedelic chemical in the brain. It's an extremely mysterious organ. It's, it's quite small. There seemed to be uh, you know, some kind of a, a kind of visual correspondence with light and with color in the pineal. Um, and also it has quite a, a long history in the context of the mystical literature. Um, it's been described as the third eye and as the crown chakra, those kinds of things. And it's spoken of as being activated when people attain quite high mystical states. And so one of the interesting aspects of pineal development also is that it appears in the human embryo at around 49 days of gestation. And 49 days is also the time that the Tibetans believe is required for one soul to incarnate onto the next. So that was a pretty interesting you know, coincidence. At the time of the differentiation of the fetus into either male or female, that also occurs at that 49-day period. And so I was uh, struck with this interesting kind of temporal you know, correspondence. And so as time went on, I started, you know, looking in into some of the chemistry of the pineal gland. And it seemed as if it was capable of making a compound called DMT. DMT stands for dimethyltryptamine. It's, it's like a chemical cousin of serotonin. And it's quite a profound hallucinogenic type of chemical. It seemed as if the pineal contained all of the precursors and, and all the enzymes and all of the building blocks that would be required to make DMT. So I started speculating about perhaps there was DMT released in the pineal gland and stimulating the brain under extraordinary states, um, either you know, through spontaneous mystical states, um, the time of death, or at times close to death. Um, and also I started speculating that perhaps it uh, was stimulated at the time of birth as well. The pineal gland is extremely well protected from stress, but you can stress the pineal gland if the stress is great enough. Pineal's protective mechanism can be overridden. And you know, so obviously the most stressful time in a person's life is at the time of death. The stress hormones like adrenaline and endorphins are at extraordinarily high levels at the time of death. Um, and so that could you know, possibly stimulate um, the formation and the release of DMT from the pineal gland at that time. And so you can you know, conceive of an individual's consciousness at the time of death being exposed to this big flash of DMT. And so the last thing that one is conscious of in the body is the release of this huge amount of this incredible psychedelic compound. During his testing, Strassman discovered that abnormal levels of the chemical DMT triggered states of consciousness that closely paralleled common experiences of an afterlife. Well, that's true. Almost everybody experienced a, a, an extremely profound, an extremely unmistakable separation of their body and their consciousness from each other. DMT at higher levels acted as a type of catalyst for near-death experiences. In fact, it seemed to actually induce the machinery of the afterlife to swing into motion. Um, I suppose one of the most unexpected aspects of the study's results was the frequency with which people described a you know, kind of contact with these intelligent you know, kinds of entities um, that were you know, conscious of them and interacted with the volunteers in this quite strange space.
So these entities were both helpful and, you know, kind of malevolent as well. Some of the helpers were kind of angelic, while other of these entities um, were kind of malignant and threatening. And, and actually a handful of the volunteers experienced, you know, um, some traumatic in, encounters with these entities. The hallucinogenic state, like the dreaming state, is a temporary disconnection from the physical body. The dreamer becomes a discarnate intelligence, traversing higher realms, no longer bound to the restrictions of time and the standard laws of physics. DMT is, you know, kind of a portal or, you know, kind of a door for the transport of the spirit out of the body, it, it appears to me. In some ways, the occurrence of DMT in our brains, in our bloodstream, is, is, is you know, kind of validation um, of a spiritual reality in quite a few ways. Could this strange chemical be offering us a window into events to come in the afterlife? The frequent appearance of helpers or assistants to ease us through the transition to other planes of existence suggests at least a strong parallel with funerary and afterlife traditions throughout history. The discovery of the unusual properties of the pineal gland illuminate the many strange references to this most mysterious part of the brain. In strange and unexpected ways, the temples demonstrated a special emphasis on the pineal gland and its role as the intermediary between mind and body the seat of consciousness, and possibly the gateway into and out of life.